Amen. Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter number 1. I want to thank the musicians for today and all the work that went into singing songs that were appropriate for the occasion and singing them well in the choir also and the orchestra and then the special singing is just a great, great day of music and that is something that is part of uh, church, part of worship and something that I think that uh, pleases the Lord and it's a blessing when it sounds like a blessing. Um, you know, when, when it goes in the ears and it, and it sounds good, it, it helps. <laughs> but it's a blessing a lot of times if it doesn't sound good when you know the person who's doing it from their heart. But it helps when you can get it to your eardrums without hurting, and, and uh, that's, that makes it an extra blessing. I'm just very grateful for the great music, and, and, um, and I, I know I might be biased, but I am v- certainly feel I am blessed each time I, I'm in a service, and it's very refreshing, and thank you for your work that goes into that. Nehemiah chapter number one, we looked at the intro last week, and And as I think about this, I think about this matter of together we build and we battle for God. And that, I think, sums up what we're going to see in the book of Nehemiah. And it kind of sums up what the Christian life may be like. It's building and it's still battling. You ever feel like you're in a battle, especially when you leave church? And and church sometimes may feel like a battle. It's not supposed to necessarily, except when we're battling from the spiritual side of it, the principalities and the powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world. But we at least we understand we're seated in the right place. We're seated in the heavenlies with the Lord. We're in the place of authority. But much of what we're doing is a building aspect where we're, we're Church is about building our lives and we're building one another, provoking one another to love and to good works. We're building our family and, and if I could use that sense. And so within that context, even the church, there's a cause for the church um, much more than maybe just the economy of the Jewish people in the Old Testament. Very thankful for the reality of the church. And we, in the men's meeting this morning, I recognize not everybody was there, but um, Brother Mooney and Brother Lebe expressed gratitude to the men. And I'm thankful for the men that showed up and finishing the home makeover uh, there at the house. And by the way, there's still tree smoking. It, it's a, it's a, this one's a makeover that will that last and so it's still but it is our property that's smoking it hasn't gotten to the neighbor's yard yet but one of the things where the Mooney mentioned was just the matter of unity and and that I believe is a key in the book of Nehemiah there's a need for the unity of the people to do this great work and he's going to point out there's some things it's a great work and by the way in that picture Uh, This morning, again, ladies, we're not there, but uh, Brother Autry was also there. He just wasn't in the picture, and Nathan Labee was not there um, in the picture, but he was there. And so I just want to be able to give honor to where honors do. But but thankful for what Nehemiah, I believe, is going to help us with and show us. So let's stand, and we'll look at the first four verses, if we could, tonight in Nehemiah chapter 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chislu in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in a great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. We'll stop right there. And um, we've asked the Lord's blessing 
upon uh, the service and trust his blessing to be upon the preaching of his word. Tonight I want to look at the man that God chooses and uses. The man that God chooses and uses. I want to ask you, are you willing to be used of God? Are you willing to be used of God the way God wants to use you? I think sometimes we don't mind being used if we could specify how we would like for God to use us. Are we willing for God to use us any way that he would like? And I think tonight we can see a little bit as to the man that God chooses and uses. Thank you. Please be seated. A certain man visited a tiny general store out in the country and for a period of time. And the owner of that store had a clerk named Jake. And Jake was known as one of the laziest men in that country, in that county. And one day, this man who frequented the little general store noticed that Jake wasn't there. And he asked the owner, where's Jake? And the owner said, well, he, he passed. And the man said, well, are you going to fill his vacancy? And the owner said, Jake didn't leave a vacancy. I, I wonder what kind of vacancy would be left in the church if and when you're no longer here. I believe God's clear intention is that every one of his people be used at serving the Lord Jesus Christ. He's gifted every one of his children and he expects us to be good stewards of those gifts. And yet like many who name the name of Christ, their faith is like football. It's just an occasional spectator sport on Sunday. They're not serving Christ day by day. And, but if you truly know Christ, the truth is you can't be happy if you want to experience God and you want to have that intimacy with God. You can't be happy just sitting on the bench or sitting in the stands. And I'm not talking about your physical ability. I'm talking about being engaged. And I believe this passage reveals the kind of person, a little bit of the inside of Nehemiah, and it helps us as to the kind of person that God uses and that God chooses. I think we have some building and some rebuilding perhaps here. There's a lot of great things that, that God is, has done, and, and many are just... Uh, enjoying the benefits of a process that was started years before. I think about our missions ministry, something that God put on Brother Caudill's heart and just did a tremendous work in establishing a missions philosophy and cultivating that. And there are things that sometimes we just take for granted. If we're not careful, we can take the, the orchestra for granted in just a, a, a period of time that has grown and, and come around to be something that is really a, a very significant part of the service. But we must understand in order to enjoy a product, God puts a greater emphasis upon the process. But as we're constantly focusing on, we want to rebuild our Sunday school. We want to rebuild our services. And I'm talking about rebuild in the sense of Nehemiah. We, we want to be able to attend to what, what areas do we need to focus on that we can maintain a health that would be there. I'm thankful for the vines working at our bus ministry and, and trying to get that uh, restarted. And we talk about often being used of God. We want to be used of God. We want God to use us. Well, it's helpful to know what kind of person God uses. We will even sing from our hearts, take my life and let it be. But do we really mean that? As Nehemiah is commissioned by heaven to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem, his willingness to be used by God, I think, is an example to us all. I want you to notice the context of his life here in verse 1. One key to being used by God is 
is really recognizing where you are. And I think verse 1, he's just starting out telling us where he is. Think about vision. Uh, when I, we hear the word vision, vision, I believe, is a God-given ability to see where you are and see where God wants you to be and know the difference between the two. See where I am now, see where I need to be and know the difference between the two. And in Nehemiah's case, we see where he is in this context, uh, not, not necessarily uh, where his, what his street address is, but just where he is in context. Because while we can't reproduce this and we can't get to this geographical place, we can at least understand some of the things that were going on in his life. First, we can see his professional context. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah. And it came to pass in the month Chislu in the 20th year as I was in Shushan the palace. And we've got to remember in the book of Ezra, God used a man by the name of Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel, God used to lead a large group of Jews back into the homeland to rebuild the temple and institute temple worship. And it took about 20 years because of the opposition of the Gentiles to get that done. Then God used, and that would be Ezra chapters 1 through 6. And in chapter 7, God puts his finger on another man's heart by the name of Ezra himself. And, and he goes in to bring revival. He takes a smaller group of Jews into the homeland. And that's about 56 years after Zerubbabel had gone in. Zerubbabel was a prince. Ezra was a scribe. Ezra's responsibility was copying the Bible. Esther, we remember, lived in this same general time frame. What was Esther's role? What was her position? Her queen. So here we have these three significant people. Zerubbabel, a prince. Ezra, a scribe. And Esther, the queen. Oh, you got the cheat sheet on the screen there. Did y'all see that? <laughs> but what was Nehemiah? He's a cupbearer. He was a cupbearer. He was one that was responsible to taste the king's wine, to taste what was put into the king's cup. To make sure it wasn't poisonous. Now this was not an insignificant job. This was a place of integrity and a place of elevation. He was most likely a eunuch. And this phrase cupbearer is connected, I believe, to that of being a eunuch. And we see hints of this toward the end of the book. But a point I'm making is he wasn't a prophet. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't a king. He was a common plain, ordinary. He was a cupbearer. The call on Nehemiah's life is an Old Testament example, I believe, of what we see over in 1 Corinthians, how it says that God doesn't use many wise, mighty, or noble. It doesn't say that God doesn't use any wise, mighty, or noble, just not many. Now, the reason why I believe he doesn't tend to use many wise, mighty, and noble is not that he doesn't want to. But I believe that there's the same criteria for the wise, the mighty, the noble, or the nobodies. And that is to recognize we are all nobodies. We're all nobodies from nowhere with nothing. See, the best backdrop for God to display his mighty power is not with the rich and famous. It's not with the highly gifted and the educated and the talented. God has all of that. The best backdrop for people to see God who is omnipotent, all-powerful, are with channels, channels who desire to be a blessing and people who recognize I'm a nobody from nowhere with nothing and we allow the God of heaven to use us and I believe Nehemiah was that man. 
You say, well, why did God use a Zerubbabel? Why did God use Esther? Why did God use Ezra? Why did God use a Daniel and a Joseph? And they were elevated. Why did God use them? Because they recognized my position and title does not determine who I am. God does. And before the God of heaven, I'm a nobody from nowhere with nothing. I'm a sinner saved by grace. The person God is going to use to bring revival and renewal to our world might not be a preacher. Might be a school teacher. Might be a nurse, a stay-at-home mother, a ditch digger, a lawyer, a janitor, construction worker, an accountant. But I know this. You are well able to do incredible things for God because you have been drawn by the grace of God. You've been washed in the blood of Jesus and you have been bathed in His mercy. And if you will but in humility and stay hungry for God, then God will give you everything you need in order to be used by Him. See, we don't like to be used sometimes by people. Being used has a bad connotation, but when God uses you, that's a good connotation. And here, Nehemiah is one of the greatest laymen. And again, you, you understand, I, I, I cringe when I say the word because I don't like to use that because I believe it, it, it does have a greater significance in the Catholic Church, this matter of, of the, the priests and the laity. And, and uh, so I, I don't like so much the idea of that separation. And we have spiritual leadership and you have lay people because the truth is at the foot of the cross, all the ground is level and every one of us have been saved to serve. But what we're saying is he did not have that specific calling to be a prophet. He was not a priest. He was not a scribe. He was a lay person who simply had a burden to see people come to know God, the true God, and to see his people in a place of restoration and revival. He had never been ordained to the ministry. He didn't go to seminary. But D.L. Moody heard a man one day say that the world has yet to see what God can do with and through and for man who's wholly yielded and consecrated to him. And D.L. Moody, who didn't get past a formal fifth grade education, said by the grace of God, I will be that man. And God used D.L. Moody to shake two continents for God's glory, and God can do the same with us. It may not be as great and fantastic of a, uh, a public ministry as a D.L. Moody, but I'm telling you, for God to use us and to have a, an intimacy with God and to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a resurrected Lord, there's no greater calling and privilege. When the first century crowd looked at the apostles, they saw them as uneducated, unlearned men, but they could tell what? They had been with Jesus. We ought to say this, God, if you can use a rock to change David's world... If you can use a donkey to speak to Balaam, if you could use a great fish to do your work in Jonah, then God, you can use me. Let me ask you, are you willing to leverage your profession and your business for the sake of the gospel? If your job has flexibility, will you use it to benefit the kingdom? And I, I look across here and there's so many of you who have done that and you've displayed that, you've exercised that, you've taken, um, you've sacrificed in your, your business realm for the sake of Christ, for the cause of the gospel. I'm saying it's, that's not, you're not thinking wrong if you're thinking about God's plan. If you have a vision for God, if you're financially blessed, you allow God to pour out his blessings through you as he has upon you. If you're retired, will you use your knowledge and your schedule to serve the Lord Jesus? Or will you forsake the Lord's work just because you're retired and collect thimbles and spoons from the nation's national parks? Doesn't that sound like fun? Brother Larry, you haven't started doing that, have you? Good, okay, that's, that's good. That was Nehemiah's mindset. Just want God to use me. 
We just see the historical context as well. We, we notice the, uh, the context of his profession, but also just the historical context of it in verse number one. It tells us in the 20th year, it says, in the middle of verse one, in the 20th year. Well, when was that? Well, Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem in 586 B.C., and the Jews were in captivity for decades. And during Darius's reign, some Jews were allowed to return to rebuild the temple that was under Zerubbabel. About 13 years before this text, Artaxerxes sent a second round of Jews to Jerusalem under the leadership of Ezra. already mentioned that. And so now... We are in about 446 B.C., and God speaks to the heart of Nehemiah. So what this does is it connects us to the reign of King Artaxerxes. And he reigned as the king of Persia from 464 to 425 B.C. And all this really is telling us is that Nehemiah knew that God's people have been in captivity for nearly 140 years since the Jews were taken into captivity. These people knew nothing but captivity. But Nehemiah was convinced that God's not through with his people. Nearly a century and a half had not thwarted God's plans or God's promises to Nehemiah. Friend, you have never strayed too far from God, but what God still has powerful promises and ability to do a mighty work in and through you if you would but repent and draw near to God. And Nehemiah is convinced we can still see God work. If you will bring God to your life, you can make a trade and he'll trade with you. He'll still take your ashes and give you beauty. He'll still take your sorrow and he'll give you gladness. And there might be a situation in your life that you think is just too far gone. And the truth is, you're not too far for God to rebuild you, to restore you, to renew you. I think it's also worth noting that Nehemiah covers, and this I said last Sunday, it covers the last historical section of the Old Testament. And if you know your Bible, these things should tell you that we're about to enter after this section of Nehemiah. We're about to go into the intertestamental period. That means that period there before John the Baptist comes on the scene. It's a period of 400 years of silence. The point is, here we are with Nehemiah. We're just a few centuries away from a baby's cry in a cattle stall. As Nehemiah is helping rebuild the walls and hanging the gates and the doors on them, He's burdened to be used of God. He sees some things and he can't get out of his heart and mind that God's up to something. And the reality is we're just a few years away from the Lord Jesus stepping into this world. I want to tell you every day of your life is significant to God. Nehemiah's work is primarily significant because it is connected to the work of the Lord Jesus that is not too far into the distance. We see the historical aspect of it. We see his business aspect, his professional context. But I also want you to see this in the latter part of verse number one. It says, I was in Shushan, the palace. And here I think stands out to me as the sovereignty of God. God's sovereignty in this context. Remember, Nehemiah is serving in the king's palace. Susa or Sushan was the winter palace of Artaxerxes. And it's ironic that Nehemiah happened 
He just so happens to be with the king. Many of the Jews are back in the homeland. Nehemiah just happens to be here with the king. And that's no accident. It's a divine appointment. That Nehemiah Jew held such a vital position in the palace and that many of the Jews, the remnant, are back in the own, their own land. Nehemiah could have joined them, but he chose to remain in the palace. And it's because God has a work for him to do. A work that could not have been accomplished perhaps somewhere else. Remember, God put Nehemiah in Susa just as he put Esther there a generation before. He put Joseph in Egypt. He put Daniel in Babylon. And none of them would have drawn it up uh, as going into a military uh, signing office and say, I'd like to serve here. They didn't sign up for this, but God put them right where God wanted them to be, but in a place where humanly it seemed like this isn't going to work. I remember reading the biography of Reuben Archer Torrey, R.A. Torrey, years ago, the prophet of certainty. And R.A. Torrey had a chance coming out of seminary to go to two places. One was a place up in um, the, the New York area, up in the Northeast, in, in a very established place, a place of great notoriety, a place where he would have been whether uh, rather comfortable and able to to spend the time exercising in his writing and preaching in the areas in which he was gifted. And he had one other opportunity that came to him. It was a place up in Minnesota. And he said it was very cold. In fact, it was frozen. Nobody had heard of it. There was really nothing established, no work. And Ari Tori went before the Lord and he came out of there while everyone else said the options really are only one. But Ari Tori said, I'm going to give God the benefit. And he went to Minnesota. He went to a place no one had ever heard of and none of his preacher friends knew of anything really going on there. But Ari Tori said, if there's a God, God can work there as well. I want to tell you the reason why R.A. Torrey worked with D.L. Moody until D.L. Moody died is because God met him in a place where it did not seem conceivable or really humanly possible to see anything take place. But R.A. Torrey, he demonstrated that one with God is always a majority because of God. He gave God the benefit of the doubt. And these men and these ladies, Esther, they were able to put God to the test. When God wants to accomplish a work, he always prepares his workers and he puts them in the right places at the right time. You want a recipe to be used by God? Remember that God has sovereignly allowed or placed you where you are. He put you in your situation you and I should then say, God, I want to leverage my circumstance for your glory. And you watch what God will do. I mean, so an, another thing here in verses two and three. I want us to see Nehemiah's burden. Nehemiah has a burden that is displayed here in verses two and three. Some people are surrounded by spiritual rubble all around us daily, and, but they just don't seem to have the discernment or the eyes or the concern to see it. Notice verse 2 that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came and he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. It's not a good sign. It's not a good report. 
Again, all around us, there might be spiritual rubble in our lives, in our lives, in our family's lives, in our marriage. Families are in shambles. Faith is in ruins. Our community is on life support. All the while, that can be happening, not just our community, but in our family, in our marriage, in our life, in our church. And many may not even care, and they're just going to continue to scroll through Facebook watching cat videos. That's really bad, isn't it? I was looking to see who wouldn't say amen there. It means you're watching a lot of cat videos. That's what happens when you don't amen at the right place. Think about many revival meetings. I always feel like, I feel like a revival meeting is a meeting for revival. But I think the tragedy too often is going into a church for a revival meeting to have revival. We spend half the meeting trying to convince God's people that we literally need God. That's tragic. There's ruin, there's rubble, there's shambles, and we're having to convince people something's not right. You have a mirror. You have the Holy Spirit. Why are we not seeing it? No one, listen, no one is reluctant to be a disciple of Jesus who wants to be a disciple. When we have to convince people, you need to be a follower of Jesus. You need to be a disciple of Jesus. I understand we've got a challenge. We all have blind spots. We all do. But when we're having to continually remind people of the same thing and challenge about the same thing, it shows an apathy that's there versus Nehemiah's burden. The problem is when people refuse to look at the problem. The problem was not, is not that there's a problem. There's always a problem. I'm not afraid to deal with the problem. I'm not afraid to get into the mess of people's lives because God's grace is sufficient. And God's the answer. He has the solution. But the greater problem is not having the problem, but of refusing to even acknowledge there's a problem. What is it that Nehemiah was burdened about? Well, notice in verse 2 that Hananiah, one of my brethren. And then he came and he was telling Nehemiah concerning the Jews that had escaped. Why, Why did Nehemiah even ask? Hey, tell me how it's going back in the homeland. Why would he even ask? Because he cared. He was burdened. See, Nehemiah's concern was for others' well-being. Not their feelings. Too many are concerned about feelings and not their well-being. Let's get practical as we hear Nehemiah's concerns and we watch his tears. I still, since COVID, I still hear comments about how much more convenient at-home worship is for families. Sure, it's convenient. And sure, sure, it's convenient to not even get out of bed since you're going to go back there later on that evening. I understand it's more convenient. It's like having groceries delivered to your door. But the church isn't a grocery store. And you can certainly receive a lot at home by live stream in your pajamas, but you cannot work and serve and be a blessing to others and helping others and not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is when you refuse to attend in person in presence. See, Nehemiah was given a burden due to the vision God was putting in his heart. If God gives you a vision 
for something, it will likely not be about you. If God gives you a vision, it's probably not going to be about you. That's why I say when when you get this hankering, don't, don't settle with the hankering. Look for the leadership of God. And if God's in it, it's going to be for His glory, your good, but it's going to be for the profit and the benefit that would serve the interest of His body, the church. God's vision for your life is never about your life. William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army, was unable to make a speaking engagement, so he wired his speech by telegraph. I I think that's not a bad idea. I mean, I don't have to do telegraph. I could send maybe a link with the video of the sermon. I can just send those and just ask them to take up a love offering. Wouldn't that be great? And we just we cover a lot of ground. think it's a good idea, but, but he's William Booth. I'm not. And he couldn't make it, so he telegraphed his message. You know what his message was? One word. Others. They got up to read his message, and they read others. 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 The hymn writer said, others, Lord, yes, others, let this my motto be. Help me to live for others and thereby to live for thee. You know what his priority, what Nehemiah's priority of his burden, others, how are my brethren doing? And then he understood, verse 3, how bad it was. They said unto me, verse 3, the remnant that are left of the captivity in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The walls of Jerusalem are broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. You know what he learned? He learned about the remnant. He learned about ruin. He learned about reproach. In other words, he learns this is pretty bad. This is a bad situation. He learned that the people were distressed. He learned that the walls were destroyed. He learned that the city was disgraced. The people were distressed, and so he begins his inquiry with the people. So the answer began with people. That's because ministry is about people. The walls were destroyed. The walls were symbolic of protection and provision and pride. And so he sees this is not a safe situation with these walls not being uh, established. The city was disgraced. The burning gates was the height of insult and mockery. But the worst of all, the Lord was dishonored. The Lord himself, it'd be said that their God could not protect them. And Nehemiah seems to be consumed with how this report reflects on the ability of God to protect his people. The passion He demonstrates in verse 4 what happens when he cares enough to ask. He cares enough to weep. Notice in verse 4. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned, not certain minutes, but days, and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. You see, Nehemiah was a man that was concerned about something outside of, he's in the king's palace. And yet he recognizes there's something significant that's taking place. There's a physical reaction. He's so overcome with grief, he had to sit down. There's an emotional reaction. He wept and he mourned. There's a spiritual reaction. He began fasting and praying. His bed was a rock, his pillow was a stone, and he cried himself to sleep at night. In Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1, it says it began at this time was in the month of Chislu, which means November, December of our calendar. Chapter 2 begins Nisan, which is March or April. What that tells us is that Nehemiah was so heavy, burdened, tear-filled, For nearly four months. 
He was visibly moved and a mess. And we're going to see in future lessons that his passion was so deep and his pain was so real and so great that the king saw it on his face. Oh, that God would burden us for the cause of Christ and our community and the condition of our church so that we can reach our community, so that we can stay on mission with His vision. Oh, that He would burden us like that to see His kingdom come and His will be done on earth now as it is in heaven. I want us to see in verse 4 here the prayer of Nehemiah. Notice the latter part of the verse. He fasted and he prayed before the God of heaven. Now, sermons could be preached about the prayers of this book. And I, I've mentioned it's one of the, the, the heaviest saturated books on prayer. But now, may it suffice to say that Nehemiah fell on his face before God before formulating a plan and getting his ducks in a row. That's the way it ought to be done. He didn't formulate the plan and say, now let's pray. He got on his face before God and then he came away with God's plan of action. You know, by contrast, several years ago, one of the pastors of one of the largest churches in America, because of the COVID situation, announced uh, that his church would not reopen until 2021. And, And by the way, don't ever confuse a crowd to be a church. But many would recognize and look to him as a leader and here in our own state and Andy Stanley said, we surveyed our folks because we wanted to know what they were thinking. So this isn't me in my prayer closet saying God has shown me, here we go. I do not lead that way. I don't recommend anybody Leading that way. Nehemiah could not possibly fathom that kind of leadership. He could not imagine leadership that did not primarily and prioritizing seeking the face of heaven and the mind of God first and foremost. Verses 5 through 11 contain one of the great Bible prayers. And we're going to dissect that later on, but I want to comment briefly. It, it, we aren't even going to have to listen. All we have to do is just look. I mean, we don't have to open our ears to this prayer. We just open our eyes and we can learn a lot about the prayer from Nehemiah. And one of the things that we easily can see in these verses is that it was a prayer of distress. The trembling in his voice, the tears in his eyes show us something about the passion of his prayers. I say, let's get away from anemic prayers. I was a little disturbed last night in a prayer meeting. It's not good. It is good for me to come home right from a revival meeting into the prayer meeting and to sense we were kind of anemic last night. God's not anemic. God's got so much in store. God's on the move. And yet, I'm waiting for some of our young people to pray. Waiting for some of our teachers to pray. Waiting for some of our people to get serious about the God who's serious about us. Nehemiah was a man who was gripped with passion. And we can hear the distress in his voice. The New Testament says that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth, accomplishes much. And so often, it's distress that gets our attention. I don't understand God's people griping and complaining and moaning about all the problems and problems and problems and problems, and yet they're not praying, they're not praying, they're not praying, they're not praying. praying. What do you expect? It's distress that God uses to get our attention. The cute little poem describes a man who fell head first into an abandoned well. The poem ends by declaring, the prayingest prayer that Fred ever said was in the bottom of a well on the top of his head. I think Nehemiah felt like he fell into a well. He said, this is bad. This is not good. His prayer is filled with the distress because his heart is so full of desperation. 
It was a prayer of distress, but it was also a prayer of desperation. It's obvious here. And it'll become even more obvious when we get to chapter two that Nehemiah needs to contact God. Listen, before rushing in to speak to the king of Persia, he bows down to the king of glory. Nehemiah needs something that only God can do. He knows the answer will not lie in his ability or his skill. He needs heaven to do something that earth cannot explain. He prays knowing that long before Ephesians was ever written, he prays in a way knowing that there's a God in heaven who is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Like Ezra before him, Nehemiah knew that he needed God's hand upon his life. He knows the desperate situations and he knows, listen, that desperate times, desperate situations do not call for desperate measures. No, Nehemiah knew desperate situations call for desperate men. Men. Not only was it a prayer of distress and a prayer of desperation, it was a prayer of dependence. And we're not reading his prayer, but we're going to get into that. We're going to go through his prayer. But I just want us to see that this is the, 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 the burden man that God uses. See, his dependence has shown that he takes his request all the way to the top. He understands that Artaxerxes is not at the top. He may be the empire's head, but Nehemiah knows that even the Persian king answers to the God of heaven. He may not know the God of heaven, but he will answer to him. Nehemiah pulls rank. He takes his petition to the throne of God. He bows in prayer And he may even be singing, I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee. His response was more than mere hand wringing, pacing back and forth. It wasn't just syrupy sentimentality. No, he's a desperate man calling on his God. Listen, we're gonna wrap this up. Years ago, watching the old Superman. I mean the old Superman. It was the black and white version. You remember that? Looked like he was wearing pajamas rather than a real Superman outfit. But the people of Metropolis were taken to a point where they could not defend themselves. And they would often say, this is a job for Superman. Perhaps God delights in taking his people to some places It might be daunting, overwhelming. It might take the wind out of your sails. Just so that you can realize this is a job only for God. Our church needs a lot of things. And one of the best ways to petition Him is to move to a place of Offering ourselves as an instrument for God to work. It's to allow God to put His burden and His vision in our heart and be willing to do whatever it is that God wants us to do. Let's go ahead and stand together. Do you have something in your life that you say this is a job for the high King of glory? Behold our God, seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. And one of the best ways to petition God to move is to offer ourselves as his instrument. So would you join me in praying? Lord, there is a rebuilding work that you and you alone can do. I want to ask you, first, would you please work on our behalf? And second, Lord, I beg you, would you do your work through us? All of us, as we together learn to build and battle for your kingdom and your cause and your glory. 
And Lord, would you work in such a way that you can only get the credit for it, but we get to be a part of why you created us for your glory, to be used by you, for you. Lord, make us channels like Nehemiah. Here's a man, Nehemiah, who had your vision. He was on mission. And he had such a broken heart, he was concerned enough to ask. He was concerned enough to weep. And he was concerned enough to pray. Lord, may we be concerned and have a passion for your cause and your glory. Lord, I thank you that 2024, you let us live to serve you. Lord, we're not going to complain This is your will. This is your sovereign design and purpose that we could live here at this time to see you work. Much work needs to be done. Lord, we need you. We need thee every hour. So would you revive us tonight on Resurrection Sunday celebration? With heads bowed, the invitation is open, the altars are open, just invite you just to do business with God, however he may have spoken to you.